Hello everyone, this is Savannah Bekowski, Project Assistant at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to a webinar entitled Water System Management for Finance and Board Members. To give you all of an idea of where others on the webinar are tuning in from, we have prepared this map. You can see that we have attendees spread all throughout the country. Thanks to you all for joining us today. Attendees can receive a certificate of attendance for viewing this webinar. This webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. AWWA recommends that you check with your licensing agency to learn about its criteria, rules, and what you need to do in order to receive credit for your attendance. It is your responsibility to verify this information with your licensing agency. If you need assistance in applying for credit to your licensing agency, please contact education services at awwa.org. For attendees who already have an AWWA customer record, your certificate will be uploaded within 30 days of this webinar date. For attendees who do not have an AWWA customer record, you will receive an email requesting you to create a customer record by a specific date to receive your certificate. If you do not create a customer record, you will not receive a certificate. This session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the various centers that make up the Environmental Finance Center Network. You can see that we have centers spread all across the country. And here are the areas of expertise that the EFCN focuses on. Workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance are provided on a variety of topics that include water loss reduction, energy management planning, water conservation and management, resiliency planning. The EFCN also provides a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through this blog. Blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, description of available tools, and small success system success stories. You will have the opportunity to subscribe to this blog at the end of the webinar. In addition to workshops, direct technical assistance, and webinars, the Small Water Systems Project is, has created a table that lists the major funding sources for drinking water infrastructure in each state and territory. Here's how you can access those tables. From the EFCN homepage, go to the Resources tab. Click on Funding Sources by State, and this will take you to a map of the country. If you click on the state you're interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for drinking water infrastructure in that state or territory. The table looks like the image on the left-hand side of the slide. For each funding program, it will include the name of the program, a short description, and contact information for someone who works in the program. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to our presenters. For our session today, we have Tanya Bromley, Program Manager at the Wichita State University Environmental Finance Center. We also have Nick Willis, another Program Manager at the Wichita State University Environmental Finance Center. Tanya, Nick, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Savannah. Uh, so I just want to, oh, hold on, we're sharing our screen. How's it look? Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Savannah. I just want to say thank you for everyone who's joining the webinar today. Uh, we're going to go through just two, let's see, there we go, two elements of uh, capacity development for water systems, the managerial capacity and financial capacity. And why are we doing this? Uh, basically, we want to build water systems capacity to plan for, achieve, and maintain compliance with drinking water standards. Uh, you know, board members have a, a big job to do in making sure that their water system is um, up to par with financially, technically, and as an organization that runs the water system. And so that's capacity development, that we're, we're building some of those skills today with um, some information and knowledge sharing uh, to make sure that, that the water system that um, serves your communities are um, running the best that they can. Uh, in 1996, the Safe Drinking Water Act um, added an amendment um, that included provisions for capacity development, um, and the framework that was created was so that EPA states and utilities could work together to make sure that water systems ran um, 
ran the best that they could. There are three components of capacity development. The managerial capacity is just that, and what we're going to go over today is just that administrative um, ability to conduct their affairs of the water system in a way where the Safe Drinking Water Act is, can be sufficiently maintained. Um, then Nick's going to talk to you today about the financial capacity elements, and that's the ability for a water system to maintain sufficient revenue to cover the cost of providing water to their communities. And then technical capacity, we won't cover today, but that's the third element of um, the capacity development program, and that's the ability just to uh, technically and reliably produce and deliver water um, that meets all the standards. So diving in uh, a little bit more to managerial capacity, uh, you know, it's the administrative and institutional capabilities of the water system. Uh, utilities with good managerial capacity um, are well organized, they run efficiently, they have, you know, good meetings where they're productive, um, they're accountable and transparent, all of those good governance, uh, uh, you know, check marks and they're responsive to customers, and the policymakers or those board members are effective, and um, they, they look at short-term planning and also at those long-term plannings. And Nick's going to talk about um, some of that short and long-term planning um, um, in the second half of the program, in the presentation. So, you know, what's the basic job of a water system? It's to provide safe drinking water at an appropriate cost to their customers. Um, you know, we've got to focus on water quality to make sure it meets all those standards, um, it's reliable, it's available when people need it, and that it's affordable, that it's not, um, you know, we don't want to underprice our water because we need to run a system and, and, you know, create revenue so that we can run it well, but it also needs to not be too expensive um, so that you're um, making sure that all segments of your community are able to access clean water. Um, and each of, you know, each of the, these elements, the quality, the reliability, the affordability, you know, they've got a rabbit hole of regulations and permits. It's, it's not simple, and we know that, and that's why we like to make sure that we're educating our board members on a continuing basis and making sure that all folks who make decisions about our water utilities um, are up to date on the, you know, the most, um, the most, uh, recent uh, policies and um, and laws and um, regulations that are out there for their water systems. Um, what laws are regulating our water systems? That's the Safe Drinking Water Act. It was passed in 1974, um, and again, it, the uh, 1996 amendments uh, updated that that law, and uh, basically the EPA administers these laws, and the states often, most states, have taken on the role of um, administering the Safe Drinking Water Act to their water systems within their states. So each state, you know, permits and monitors, collects the reports, and is in charge of the training and technical assistance um, that are needed for the water operators and for the board members as part of the capacity development. As a board member, uh, each each board member has some responsibilities, and they're pretty hefty responsibilities once you're elected to a board that runs a water utility. Uh, it's that board's responsibility to make sure that the Safe Drinking Water Act is uh, followed and that all of the requirements are met. And, uh, you know, there are three basic, you know, duties of a of a board member, the duty of care, making sure that you're making, um, using good judgment and making good informed decisions. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect and make perfect decisions, but that you are taking all the information that you have available to you and making decisions in the best interest of the water utility and the customers that you serve. Um, then there's the duty of loyalty. You know, that's just um, acting in good faith that on the on behalf of your community, not um, not on like a personal behalf or, you know, for something of a personal interest. And then the duty of obedience, uh, you know, you're following all the laws, all of your bylaws and policies um, from the federal, state, and your local, um, local level. So what's it mean to be a good board member? Um, basically, you have to be a good team member. That's the number one uh, 
the number one responsibility of a board member who runs a water utility is to be a good team member uh, for the board that you serve on. You know, showing up to meetings, making sure you're providing input, reading things before you, um, you know, reading, you know, about what's going to be discussed at the next meeting, and then then the board as a whole, the responsibility of the board is, you know, thinking long term, setting big policies for the, the, the water system, uh, you know, making sure you're communicating with customers and that the customer's uh, input is being heard, and, um, you know, of course, acting transparently, overseeing those finances, uh, and just basically being a good representative of the utility in which you serve. So being knowledgeable enough to talk about the utility with customers um, and with the people in your community, being able to answer basic questions. It doesn't mean you have to know everything about how the water's treated and how the system works, but you know, what are you know, knowing what the rates are, uh, how much, you know, what the treatment, general treatment process is, those sorts of things so you can answer customers' questions. Where do they can go to find out more information? So those are board member responsibilities, and they differ from staff roles and responsibilities. Um, staff roles and responsibilities are are day to day running of the water system. They're implementing the policies that are set by the board. They're maintaining those financial records. They're making the day to day purchases. Um, you know, the board members don't need to know every little thing that gets purchased, but you know, they're overseeing the big picture finances while, you know, the staff on the ground are making those day-to-day -day purchasing decisions. Um, they're implementing, you know, they're operating and maintaining the equipment, they're testing the water, they're providing that one-on-one -on -one customer service. And the number one goal, uh, role of a staff member is to keep the board informed. So there, there's a give and take. The board needs to inform staff of policies and, and concerns from the community, and the staff needs to then uh, continually inform the board members about how the system is running, uh, you know, what customers are saying, anything coming down the pike that um, could be a barrier or a concern or an issue, something that might be, you know, cut breaking in the future. Uh, those sorts of things need to be communicated up to the board because the last thing board members want are surprises. So the more communication there is, the better. And one of the, uh, the key things that a staff member can do um, to help the board is to uh, implement an asset management program. And the Environmental Finance Center Network has lots of blogs and webinars on this topic. I have two slides, and I'm going to cover real briefly. But there's, in your states, probably even have um, workshops, day-long workshops on asset management plans. But um, asset management is a process that allows staff um, to determine the best use of the system's limited funds. So, and the, the staff really needs board support in um, implementing the asset management plan. Because to do a really good asset management plan, you need, um, you, need, you need to invest time. And from the staff members, you need to potentially invest some funding for, you know, uh, a computer software program or, um, you know, it, you don't always have to buy the most expensive one. It could be just an Excel spreadsheet, but the investment of the time and the resources it takes to, to put together an asset management plan um, needs board support. Um, and then what results out of that asset management plan um, can help the board determine how best to use the limited funds that you have. Asset management uh, is just a process where um, you try to figure out the best, how you provide a service at the lowest life cycle cost. So again, um, the lowest life cycle cost doesn't mean it's free and no cost, but you know, how can you best use your funds to maintain all your, your assets, the pumps, the pipes, um, all the technology that you need to run the water system? Uh, how do you maintain that in the best way to keep the service running for your customers level of service that they expect. Um, there are five core components to asset management. Um, assessing the current state of your assets, that's basically kind of just like the inventory, what have you got and, you know, what kind of state is it in? Is it, you know, almost dead? Is it brand new? Those sorts of questions. And that's, that's the piece that could take the longest is finding all of those parts and pieces and logging them and, and assessing their status. 
And then level of service, finding out from your customers and from what you have, what the level of service you can provide and what the customers want. And criticality, looking at all those assets, which ones are most critical, assigning kind of like a ranking system for those, what are those assets that could fail and cause the whole system to fail, or what what of the assets that you have, you have some redundancies and, and you can you know, maybe defer maintenance on that or maybe you won't have to replace that quite so soon because you've got some redundancy. So criticality is a really important part of the asset management program. And then life cycle costing, how much is it going to cost over time, determining those things because that helps the board, once that's determined, that helps the board make those decisions about um, where to spend their money. And then the funding mechanisms basically is that long-term funding. Where do we find the money to do all this? How are we going to save or, or borrow in order to um, fund the things we need to do to make sure all our assets are in place? So that's a real quick overview of asset management. Again, we could dive into this really deep and spend hours and hours on it. Um, but wanted to make sure we touched on this today because we want to really make sure board members know the importance of asset management and, the, and being supportive of the time that it takes to do an asset management plan because it will help them in the future make good decisions about their um, system. Uh, then the next thing board members do um, is develop policies and procedures. That's the, the key thing board members, you know, the to-do list of a board member is to set policies. Um, the staff implements the policies, but together the staff and the board should write the policies together because the board has the vision of where they would like to see the water system go, but the staff knows what's, what's feasible and doable, and, the, um, and so writing those policies together is the best way to make sure that the policy is effective. Um, one of the, the best things that a board could do is to set, to look at all the policies that you have and set a schedule of review for all those policies. Maybe you've got five policy manuals, you've got a personnel policy, a financial policy, and three other policy type things, a code of ethics, those sorts of things. Um, you know, every year review one of those. You know, everybody reads through the policy and checks it out. You know, is it up to date? Does it meet you know, meet the mission and vision that we have for our community? What needs to be updated and changed? so that you're not reviewing all the policies every year, but you're just you're taking it in bite-sized chunks, one, one or two policies every year to review. So you're reviewing them on, on a regular basis. And then you want to be sure that um, all the staff and all the board members know where all the policies are and have a chance to read and review them so everybody knows how, you know, what's expected. And the benefits of having good policies is that it attracts qualified employees. People want to know what's expected of them, and good policies that are followed are a good way to keep to attract employees, but also keep them because then there's transparency and everyone knows what's expected. Um, and it, and customers also like to see that the that there are policies and that that people that boards and utilities have a plan. Personnel policies are just one example of a policy that most utilities should have. Um, you know, this is a policy that talks about, you know, what's expected of staff, what are, what's the work schedule look like, what's the dress code, How, what are the behavior expectations, what's, you know, what's the email or, you know, the internet um, usage expectations, um, you know, when will I get paid, how do I ask for time off, all those sorts of things um, should be in a personnel policy, and there's lots of, you know, the, the League of Government type organizations have really good um, resources for personnel policies and what should be included. Um, and personnel policies are, are good for staff because then they know what's expected and they can't say, oh, I didn't know that. But it's also good for board members to know what those personnel policies are um, so that if, you know, for some reason there's a complaint or, um, you know, there's some some, for some reason, there's a, a staff member that um, is having some, some concerns. If there's a personnel policy and some documentation about how they're not meeting that policy, you have some, some ability to, um, to go to that staff member and talk about what expectations aren't being met. Um, and, you know, making sure that, you know, all new staff 
are able to read the policy and sign a statement saying that they've read the policy allows the board to um, have that um, that ability to say you can't or yeah so the staff member can't say well I didn't know that you didn't nobody told me that well if you have a signed statement saying they read the policy and the policy is there like they were late every day for six months and they said well nobody told me I couldn't be five minutes late every day well if it's in the policy manual to be on time then you have some some backing um, to provide some repercussions for the than you know, not showing up on time. Um, but even for good staff members, um, personnel policies aren't just for you know, correcting behavior, but it's also, you know, it helps staff members know it's expected and then there's a comfort level there. Purchasing policy, these are really important. Um, it's not the board's role to weigh in on every purchase, um, but it's the board's role to look at the purchasing policies, write purchasing policies that protect the utility um, from perceived um, perceived any um, perceived mis you know mishandling of funds, but also um, allows them to um, make sure that funds aren't mishandled um, and that you know the public funds are used efficient efficiently and used for the right things. Um, yeah, and be sure to have all of the staff members who. Um, deal with the money of any kind, review the or purchasing policies and sign that they have read them and they, they um, are, are familiar with the, what the policies are and will follow them. Code of ethics, this is um, for staff and for board, um, you know, want to make sure that everybody reads and signs codes of ethics, um, just, uh, it's just talks, codes of ethics talk about what is ex expected and the guidelines for what is uh, ethical and unethical, you know. Um, there should be no extra quote unquote perks for being a board member of a water utility or being on a city council. Um, the, you know, you don't, if you're on a city council, you don't get your, uh, you know, street plowed first in a snowstorm or, you know, your friends shouldn't be able to, you know, not pay their water bill for a few months. Those sorts of, um, those sorts of things um, could be considered in a code of ethics um, unethical. Um, code of ethics helps board members in that it shows what they should and should not do, and also allows the community to see that the board is not doing those sorts of things. So it works with. Um, reality and with perception. Um, it makes sure that um, the values of your community are reflected, integrity, transparency, fairness. Um, remember Warren Buffett said it takes 20 years to build a reputation and it takes five minutes to ruin it and I think in this day and age it takes like two seconds to ruin a reputation um, with social media and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, really looking at, you know, how your board and your staff, um, maybe, you know, one of the things that trips most um, public entities up or, or, you know, if they get a Christmas gift from a, a contractor and, you know, who gets that? You know, is it shared between all the staff or does, the, you know, one board member take it home and keep, you know, the fruit basket for themselves? You know, no, you know, under, in a code of ethics, you should have a section where it talks about, you know, any gifts to staff. It uh, should be shared with all the staff, you know, put it in the, put the fruit basket in the break room and everybody can share and partake. Those sorts of things um, so that it, so that it, as a public entity you are seen as um, transparent and not getting any of these perks. Customer service policy, um, you know, most likely everybody's got one of these. Uh, it allows your staff to know how to serve customers and it, it talks, it tells customers knowing, tells customers what to expect from the utility, um, you know, talking about how to hook up to the water utility, how to cancel service, how to pay a bill, um, you know, what happens if I can't make my payment, who do I call, those sorts of things all go in a customer service policy. Um, these are, those are great things to put, you know, just online. It shouldn't just be in a notebook on a shelf somewhere, but it should go out to, um, be available for all customers to see. Should be really easy to understand. Um, you know, it, detail 
the water rates, you know, why they're being charged, what they're being charged. Um, it, to just help customers um, understand and not become frustrated if, if something doesn't go perfectly, if, you know, there's a water leak or something, um, if they go online, they can find out what the process is for, you know, a water leak, this is what happens, this is who to contact or what we're going to do to fix your water leak. Um, it really, especially in this day and age where we like all of our information at our fingertips, the more information you can give your customers um, about what to expect from their water service, the better. All right, I think I have a, a polling question now <laughs> about customer communication. Yes. So if attendees could please input your answer to the following question. How do you communicate with your customers? And you can select more than one answer here. Annual customer confidence reports, bill stuffers, civic organization meetings, newspaper or local media sources, or social media outlets. And we'll leave this poll question up for another five seconds. Getting ready to close this poll in three, Two, one. So a majority of attendees um, have picked annual customer confidence reports, followed by bill stuffers, um, local media and newspaper comes in a third, and then social media and civic organizational meetings um, are tied. And back to you. Okay. Great. All right. Well. Um, it sounds like everyone is communicating with their customers a little bit, but we don't want our water utilities to be our community's best kept secret. You know, we, we bury the pipes underground, all the pumps are underground, or, you know, we're, we're hiding all of our infrastructure because, you know, nobody wants to look at it. Um, but a water utility, I mean, no one goes, you know, more than 15 minutes at the beginning of their day without utilizing some form of water. And so we want to make sure that, that our customers realize the importance of the service that we provide them as a water utility. So we want to communicate with them a lot. Uh, so, you know, these, the list here on the left talks about all the different ways, not, it's not even an exhaustive list, of ways you can communicate with customers. You know, there's our con annual consumer confidence report. Um, we can write, you know, letters into the newspaper, we can do billboards, posters, you can go out to schools and talk, um, to, to students. You know, there's a misconception that people just don't care, but um, I, people are very interested in information, and so, you know, they don't want to read a, a six-page report on how, they, how we treat the water, but they would be really interested in a two-sentence blurb about how, you know, you fixed a water leak and kept the water running at the local um, retirement center, you know, because of your quick response, they only didn't have water for 20 minutes or whatever. Um, you know, constantly communicating with customers about what you're doing, um, the projects that you're working on, the new technology you're installing um, is, is a really good way to build trust and, um, and to make sure that you've got a whole community of people that are really supportive and behind your water utility. Um, and, you know, what's the story that's being told right now about your water utility in your community? Think about that for a little bit. What was the last thing that was in the news or people were talking about around town at the coffee shop about your water utility? Was it that your water was a great value? Was It's inexpensive. It has people who are staff members who are dedicated to the work that they do? Um, is it talk about how safe and clean and good tasting their water is? And if it's not that's not what's being talked about around the coffee shop, um, how do we get to that? Because if we don't start talking about the water and, and putting out the messages, you know, what, what could the story be told for us? You know, um, there's some, um, <clears throat> some you know, there's the Flint, Michigan, there's, um, you know, there's been some other stories about water systems at, that are atypical. You know, most water systems across the U.S. are doing a great job in providing safe water to their pe to people in their communities. And we want to make sure that that story is being told about your 
community or about your water system um, when it's doing a good job. So you want to make sure that story is on the front of everyone's, that good story is on the front of everyone's mind. So how do we talk to people? Well, think about who you have in your communities. If you have a lot of young people in your communities, you know, it's social media. It's um, maybe <clears throat> Instagram or Facebook. Um, you know, just making sure your website is mobile friendly so people can look on their phones and that website where the customer service policy is, um, is, is able to be used easily on a phone is really important. If you've got a lot of families in your community, email and Facebook, um, having community events, going out to schools is a great way to, to start talking to people about the work that you do. Um, if you've got some, like a lot of retirement Diaries in your community, Facebook and newspapers might be the way to go. The largest, you don't, you think, oh, Facebook, not for the older generation, but that's not true. Um, the fastest growing uh, segment of the population using Facebook is actually 65 and over. Everyone wants to keep up with their grandkids, and that's how they do it these days. So um, you want to communicate all the time, not just in advance of a rate hike or when big expensive projects are coming, uh, because then it just seems like the water system is just always asking for money um, and there's never enough. But if you talk about yourselves all the time and about all the things um, that you're working on and doing and the good service you provide, um, again, then when it's time to ask for the big ask or the rate increase, you've already got folks behind you and interested and on board with your water utility. And then Again, you know, use those consumer confidence reports, and but make them more than just the the spreadsheet of the of of your contaminants and what the the rates were, and make sure that you're explaining what those um, what that spreadsheet means to folks, because when they see words on a page um, about the chemistry in the water and um, nitrates, you know, those words. Um, for folks that don't aren't in the business are a little scary. And so making sure that you explain what your results are in simple language is really important. And then using that consumer confidence report to really, um, really advertise and make sure that people know where their water comes from and what a great uh, resource that it is and um, how important your resources to the community um, is, is a great way to make sure you've got continuing support from your community. And um, board members can be a big part of this, helping take pictures around town of the, of the water being used. And so those pictures can be used in the Consumer Confidence Report, um, making it look good and um, exciting to folks. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Nick. Uh, we're going to talk about money. All right. Uh, we'll be talking about um, one of the uh, other of the, the three components of, of uh, capacity development uh, for uh, public water suppliers, um, that being financial. Um, this is the one that, that often um, is in the most need of attention for a lot of systems, and we'll cover some of the uh, kind of backbone of it. Um, the EFC network and uh, Wichita State um, uh, Environmental Finance Center both do uh, a, a sense of training on uh, water system uh, finances, uh, rates, and, and water system pl uh, planning efforts. So uh, this, again, is a very uh, quick overview. Um, feel free to contact uh, uh, myself or anybody at the EFC network um, for more assistance or, you know, look for future training opportunities. Um, financial ca capacity, a short definition of that is that the utility has financial resources to supply safe drinking water in the short and the long term. What the short term means is basically paying your day-to-day -day bills, ensuring you have staff, um, re repaying any debt you may have um, per, per whatever the terms of the loan are, um, keeping uh, current with uh, leases, repairs, contractors, things like that. The long term is uh, that you're, you're looking to finance expansion, if, if that's in your future. Um, major equipment, uh, treatment plants, et cetera, are um, being thought of um, and planned for replacement or rehabilitation of those. Um, that you're looking at what you're going to have to do to retain staff and qualified operators. 
Um, and then for many utilities, uh, it's also ensuring adequate water supplies. And this is often the case with uh, utilities in growing areas, but it can also be in, in uh, utilities that don't have growing populations or, or customer bases uh, where there are uh, groundwater declines occurring, which is not uncommon in much of the western part of the United States. Some of the indicators that are used to, to, to evaluate financial capacity. Um, the left uh, column here is adequate and protected financial resources. So this is things like, are you doing an annual budget? Do you have water rates that are examined on a periodic basis and your, that your revenue is keeping up with your expenditures? Are there financial controls? Um, this would be something that uh, the position of a, of a city clerk or a treasurer um, would have a lot of oversight on. Um, do you have two parties sign a check before it goes out the door? Um, how do you uh, maintain control over any cash that uh, customers pay you with? Things like that. Um, Financial audits are also a good indicator of um, uh, strong financial controls and um, financial capacity. Your books are what they say they are um, after you know the audit results have come in. That 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 should give uh, you know those member those people on the call who are board members. If you have an audit and there's uh, very few issues come up um, as a result of it, um, that's a sign that, that things are being managed well and, and and at least recorded in the right manner. That that. Just because you have a good audit result does not necessarily mean you have enough revenue to pay your bills in the future, um, but it does mean that, that your system is probably in relatively good shape um, when it comes to financial management. Um, the final one here is credit access. Um, even if your system doesn't have outstanding debt, the ability to take on debt um, is very important when we're looking at long-term um, large capital improvement type of projects. So, the other, the other kind of um, uh, facet of financial capacity is that you're planning for the expenses of the future. So you're, you're taking care of the now and, and you're planning for the future. This is things like capital improvements. We'll talk more about that. Um, that your revenue is meeting expenses and that you're planning that over the next three, or three, four, five years out when you're doing things like examining your rates. Um, you have reserves. Uh, you have reserve accounts established and funded. Um, and then also that you're, you're cognizant of any regulatory changes that may be coming your way. Um, that could be a change in a water quality standard, or for some systems it could be um, uh, the requirement for treatment um, as your uh, current water supply declines in quality. Um, so that there's, there's kind of uh, two ways that that can, can hit you as a water system. Um, we will go to a poll here before we cover the rate slide. You got it. So if attendees could please answer the following question. Is your system budgeted to be cash flow positive this year without a general fund transfer? And we'll leave this poll question open for about another five seconds. Getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. As you can see, a majority of our attendees voted yes, and it's a pretty close tie between no and unsure. And back to you now. Okay, that's, that's a good sign. Um, uh, one of the utility best practices um, in, in basically all utility functions is that they should be self-sustaining financially. Um, there are cases where that's not really very possible to, to, to happen, um, but in most cases that is that is um, considered a best practice and something you should shoot for. Um, most utilities get the vast majority of their revenue from uh, monthly customer bills. Um, so this is uh, minimum fees and generally a uh, usage charge uh, based upon the amount of water utilized. Um, so those expenses should be covered by those rates and, and any fees you take in for, for other um, types of, of work being done by the the utility or services being performed. Um, and if, if you don't adequately um, have the true cost of service um, within uh, your utility system right now, meaning that there is some sort of a, a transfer in from another, either another utility or a uh, tax source, um, customers are going to be undercharged. And typically when something is um, 
undercharged uh, for, um, it can lead to, to greater utilization of that resource. Um, for many people on the call, um, you probably have sufficient water supplies and capacities, but if you do not, um, it's very important um, in long-term planning efforts to have that true cost of service reflected in your rates and not subsidized, um, assuming affordability is not too much of a concern. We're going to cover budgets and budgeting. Um, hopefully most of the people on the call do um, uh, implement annual budgets. Um, so a budget is basically how, what are my projected expenses in the coming year? Um, and how do I pay for them? What is my income um, is, is kind of the other side of the, the budget. Um, oftentimes with municipalities and being that this um, presentation is covering 50 states and, and U.S. territories as well, um, uh, your specific steps to adopt an annual budget will vary from the board says it so to having to have public hearings and newspaper publications. So. So check to see uh, what that process is in your own uh, uh, area. Um, but basically, a budget looks at the past few years um, and then projects out to the future. From year to year, most operation and maintenance budgets don't change a whole lot. Typically, um, relatively slow rises in most costs. Um, most budgets are done by staff members um, for very small utilities. Oftentimes, um, uh, 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 one or two board members might put the budget together and then it's adopted after that um, if you don't have internal uh, capacity to kind of get that uh, budget together. Um, but the board uh, role is both review and approval of the budget. So when you approve a budget, you should um, have a pretty good idea of what's uh, being outlined within it. Uh, when you are putting together a budget, um, uh, one key thing is to remember that water use does swing from year to year, particularly if you have a lot of irrigation customers. So if you're in a drought, you'll often have higher usage. If it's rainy, you'll have less. Um, your large suppliers will also typically have a pretty good knowledge of future costs. You can call your electric provider, you can call your chlorine or your chemical provider, and they'll give you a pretty good idea of of expected cost increases in their industry for next year. Um, and this should be done for your larger line items. Um, it's also important to keep an eye on events of significant users. If, if you have a user that's more than 5 to 10 percent of your revenues, um, what are they doing? What, what are their plans uh, for the coming year that could have a significant impact on um, your utility finances? Um, it's always important to use several past years because of the variability in water demands. Um, it's also very important to include major changes. If, if for example, you've just undertaken a uh, significant energy efficiency project, um, implemented, uh, you know, constructed a new well field or um, a new treatment plant, that's going to change your cost. Um, if you haven't done anything like that, um, you, you're, you have more budget certainty. Also, um, including periodic events is recommended. Um, sometimes operations and maintenance budgets will include things like divers for uh, 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 above ground and underground, underground storage tanks. Um, those that, that's typically not done every year, um, but is included in operation maintenance budgets. So you'll see some swings from year to year up based on that. Um, the, the bold here is that budget should be based on your necessary expenditures. If you base it off your projected revenue um, and it's not based on what you need to do for your system but what you can do based on your, your projected revenue, eventually you're going to be shortchanging things. And that, that, that is one of the cornerstones of financial capacity for water utilities. If you don't have enough finances to do what's needed to do, you will begin to see failures or reductions in, in level of service. We're going to talk a little bit about financial reserves with one more poll. Yes. Could attendees please answer the following question? Does your system have dedicated reserves? And we'll leave this poll question open for another 10 seconds. And another five seconds. Getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. A majority of our attendees voted yes. And back to you, Nick. Good. Um, uh, 
Reserves are very important. I'm going to cover um, some of the, the, the recommendations as to amount and um, the types of reserves that, that utilities should have. Importantly, you can call these different things. Um, it's more important to have money um, for uh, you know, financial contingencies or, or plans uh, than to have specifically named accounts, so, so keep that in mind. Operational reserves for water utilities are typically recommended at a minimum of three months to um, 180 days of, of your annual budget of expenditures. Um, these allow you to smooth cash flow, um, allow you to pay for unexpected expenses. Um, because things happen, um, you, you might have high fuel bills, uh, there's some volatile um, inputs into utilities. When I was in utility management, we had a 24-7 uh, water treatment plant, and two of our operators went on FMLA that same year. So our overtime budget was greatly exceeded. We had money in the bank uh, in order to not have that be like a, 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 any sort of financial crisis. Repair and replacement reserves um, are going to be based on a schedule. So this is going to be um, things like pumps, uh, tower maintenance, well servicing, those items that you really don't want to go into debt for um, to re replace, that you can have uh, a projected lifespan, save year to year, and then um, hopefully uh, replace it on a, on a regular schedule. Debt service reserves are often required by your lenders. Um, if you uh, have a, a uh, debt instrument out there, you need to follow whatever they require. Um, it is important to note that debt service reserves do reduce interest costs to the utility, so there is some benefit to you, though mostly it reduces financial risk uh, to the lender. Emergency reserves, um, stuff happens. Um, and we don't know what that is going to be necessarily, but uh, it's extra money on top of all the other reserves. One reasonable recommendation, and there's a lot of divergence on this, this recommendation, is the minimum cost of your most expensive capital item not in inventory. So let's say, for example, you have a very expensive uh, uh, water pump um, that costs $30,000. You don't have one sitting on the shelf. Um, that you may determine that is your most expensive item, and therefore you you would have at minimum thirty thousand dollars in a reserve account. We're going to uh, uh, close up my part with a discussion of capital improvement planning. Um, so, what is capital improvement versus regular maintenance and repair? Um, this is regular maintenance and repair, um, keeping things in a uh, properly functioning condition, but not doing major overhauls to it, where a capital improvement is uh, drastically changing um, the lifespan or a, a wholesale replacement of, of some of your assets. Um, your, your maintenance and repair is going to be things like oil changes. Uh, capital improvements are going to be things like a new, new water tower, new water lines, uh, maybe a wholesale meter change out, um, something like that. Why you want to have a capital improvement plan as a, a board member of a utility? First and foremost is to meet regulatory requirements. Um, this is a proactive um, uh, measure that you take. As you leave uh, your board positions, when new people come on, um, a capital improvement plan helps them get up to speed quite quickly. Um, it also uh, allows funding institutions and, and uh, they like to see that you're thinking long term, that it's not just the project I'm trying to get funding today, that, that you know, five years down the line I'm going to do something else within my system. Some of the tips, if you don't have a capital improvement plan, set some arbitrary minimum price for an asset. You don't want to have shovels on your capital improvement plan, um, but something like uh, uh, $10,000 pump uh, might be something you, you want to have on your capital improvement plan. Um, it's very, very important to stay realistic. Um, EPA recommends a five-year minimum, though some people go out to even, even in excess of 20 years. It's important that all plan items are justified. Um, a capital improvement plan is a plan, not a wish list. Uh, try and coordinate projects. Um, we've all seen the water line break after a road has been repaved. Um, Typically, lumping construction in the same location can save significant engineering and construction cost. It's important to look at broad options. 
Um, there's, there's often more than one way to skin a cat. Um, if you don't detail the funding options for a capital improvement, it's unlikely to happen. So outline how you plan to get funding and then discuss it in, in open meetings. You can have reserves for capital improvement plans. Um, they will typically pay upfront cost. Um, rarely will capital improvements be done without um, some sort of debt financing, but capital improvement reserves could be implemented to avoid debt entirely. More likely than not, it will be utilized to reduce debt burden. Um, in best practice, transferring most depreciation that's spent to this fund uh, will get you a long ways. I'm going to turn it back over to Tanya. <laughs> All right, Nick wanted me to explain the big old plate of nachos. So we just this is our, our slide to say thank you for joining us today and for um, just building a little bit of your capacity for your board and your, for, that runs your water utility. We know all of your plates are very full. Um, board members are, um, you know, most of the time are not paid positions. You've already got a big old plate of nachos already, and then we're adding running a water utility on top of that and so um, it's an but it's a really important part of your community um, your schools your businesses your um, hospitals your um, homes would not be functioning without it your community would basically fall apart if it didn't have that water system and so taking on the water utility as one of your responsibilities is a is a big deal and we acknowledge that and we want to say thank you for doing it and um, you know building your capacity for managerial and financial um, is an important part of that and um, I hope you continue this isn't just a one and done continue to look for ways to continue to build your board's capacity so that um, your water systems run run smoothly and I'll turn it back over to Savannah thanks Tanya so we do have a few questions from attendees the first question is, Is can you or Nick speak to the issue of second homeowners being charged a lower rate, even though the system has to be in place, whether they are there or not? Uh, yes, um, we, we have this uh, locally. Um, there's, there's getting to be a lot of attention on this because the pipes have to be there, you know, every day of the year, even though the homeowners aren't. Um, some systems are attempting to... Um, increase uh, the fees to have, uh, you know, a meter pulled um, like is often done or water service turned off. Um, there's also some communities that are looking at a minimum fee uh, regardless. For example, if that second home catches on fire, the fire department will be there utilizing the, the water utilities services to extinguish it. So, um, I, I would caution anybody to, to check with their legal counsel as to what may be legal and what may not be legal. Um, but but this is uh, going to be an issue. Um, likewise, your your local state level municipal utility associations or rural water associations may have dealt with this um, and in those more local uh, organizations may be helpful um, on this specific issue, but but it is it it is a significant issue in in many communities out there. Thank you, Nick. And so the next question is that it was mentioned that EPA has a five year CIP minimum requirement. Is this right? There there is, to my knowledge, no no requirement to have a capital improvement plan. EPA has uh, numerous documents out there on how to operate, how to manage, um, how to finance water utilities. Um, in their guidance documents, they, they recommend a minimum of five years. Perfect. The next question is, please explain how a CIP differ and work together. I... Wait, say that one again. How a CIP? Yes, please explain how a CIP differ and work together. Does that need to be? Well, a, a, a capital improvement plan is a, a CIP is, is the, the common abbreviation for it. Um, it, it functions um, differently from an annual budget in that it is a, a plan 
that's laid out over multiple years and focuses only on basically those larger expense items. Um, the other major difference between a capital improvement plan and an annual budget is that um, in most locations, uh, an annual budget has to be funded out of current revenues. Um, so you can't take on debt in order to pay your water operator or your chemical supplier or your electric bill. Um, where a capital improvement plan often uh, involves uh, a significant amount of, of external financing, uh, more often than not in the loan form of loans, bonds, um, or you know grant money if it's available for your project. And a CIP is non-binding. It's yes. it's it's a plan, but it's not required purchases. Yeah. So yeah, in depending on the laws governing your systems finances. Um, oftentimes budgets, if, if you're going to go over budget, um, it's, it's a process to inform the public and, and have another hearing. Um, generally, there's not any type of requirements like that for capital improvement plans if they're not followed. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more quick question is, um, has there been any conversation on what some systems are doing regarding certification requirements for board mem members. Educating board members is a great need, but how do we make them more accountable? Um, great question. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there, there's a, I can't think of the, the name of it, but there's a, basically every state that administers the Safe Drinking Water Act has people in, in, in capacity development, and um, all of them kind of struggle with this question. Um, you know, the, the majority of board members I've ever worked with get paid, you know, $120 a year and, uh, you know, lose several evenings with their families uh, a month and, uh, you know, may get yelled at when they go to the coffee shop. So, <laughs> um, the... Uh, I have seen some states try to put in efforts to educate board members further if there are indications that they definitely need it, so they violated some sort of open records or open meeting law um, that would, you know, apply to anything or specifically to regulatory issues where they've kind of been recalcitrant and, and unwilling to try and rectify the, the, the regulatory compliance issue. but. Broadly, I don't know of anything like that. All right. So we have come up at the 4 o'clock hour Eastern, 3 o'clock Central. Um, we have ran out of time for questions, but all questions that were submitted will be followed up offline. I do have um, two more quick polling questions for you folks. The first one is if you would like to subscribe to the Environmental Finance Center blog. Um, if you want to sign up for the blog but do not have the opportunity to submit your polling answer today, you can sign up for the blog on the efcnetwork.org website. And I'm getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. And the next quick polling question is if you are a small water system of 10,000 or fewer people served, are you interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance? Again, if you're unsure about technical assistance or do not have the opportunity to submit your polling answer today, please review the technical assistance form on the efcnetwork.org website. And I'm getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. And lastly, in the chat box, there is a survey link. If you could just take a few minutes to let us know how you thought today's session went. Um, you will also be receiving a follow-up email that indicates when the recording and PowerPoint are available for download. I just want to thank Nick and Tanya for providing their expertise to board members on water system management and finance. I want to thank all the attendees that joined us today. Um, Nick or Tanya, can I throw it back to you for any additional closing comments? No, um, thanks for attending and, and feel free to contact Tanya or I. Yep. Yeah. Let us know if you what you need. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.